Okay, so welcome everybody um, to tonight. Um, my name is Richard Rowe and I work at Edendale Farm in Eltham, which is a part of Nillimbic Council. Before we do start, I'd like to do just an acknowledgement of country. And this is where we acknowledge the traditional um, custodians of the land. Um, and we are meeting on different places uh, virtually here tonight, but um, Eltham and Nillimbic is in the traditional um, areas of the Wurundjeri people. So I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and uh, emerging, um, and also to elders of the other communities that are online tonight. Um, also to recognise that um, the, the, the Indigenous people of Australia have a very, very strong connection to the, uh, the li all the living things, um, whether they be plants or animals, including the platypus, um, and that there's lots that we can learn uh, from, the, from the Indigenous people around how to better look after um, all of these um, um, systems and, and all of these animals. And so tonight we're here focusing on the Diamond Creek, the platypus, but also the, uh, the fish that are living in there. Now, a little bit of housekeeping um, is that, oh, somebody's got a microphone on. I'll just get anybody to put microphones off if possible. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. So your cameras and your microphones can be turned on and off, but I would ask you if possible that you try and keep especially your microphones off as we're going through tonight. Um, we do, we'll be taking questions um, at the end of the session, although there, if there's some relevant ones, we might take them during the, um, during the actual chef session. But if you would like to ask some questions, um, note them down in the chat. And Teresa, who is also online tonight. So Teresa is the, um, from, with Melbourne Water, she's the uh, Water Watch coordinator and looks after the platypus and water bug programs within um, Melbourne Water. So she'll be helping to curate the uh, questions tonight. So any questions of all, um, um, as we go through tonight, and I'll get you to put them down into the chat. That would be wonderful. Now, by way of introduction, um, like to, well, for those that are new to our platypus celebration activities, I'd like to welcome you. So tonight's webinar is the third in a series of four webinars that we're holding to um, raise awareness of the Diamond Creek, the life in the current Diamond Creek and the platypus um, in there as well. Um, and so tonight's topic is going to be on the native fish of Victoria and in the Diamond Creek. So all of these events that we're running um, are a part of the Nillibic Shire uh, Council program and also Melbourne Water um, program. Um, so we'd like to express our thanks to Melbourne Water and the Living, uh, Livable Communities Livable um, Waterways grant, right, which we've received to, to help this uh, make this happen. We're very lucky in Nillimbic to be able to have this elusive, um, iconic Australian animal, the platypus, um, within the Diamond Creek itself. Um, and it's a very, very popular um, icon and, and animal in, in Australia and also around the world. And it's really a flagship um, creature or animal um, around freshwater conservation as well, which is what we're talking about um, the next few days. Now, the platypus is actually um, in danger of disappearing from many of our waterways and has recently been listed as vulnerable, threatened, a uh, vulnerable threatened species in Victoria due to a, a whole lot of evidence that shows that populations are declining, um, localised extinctions are occurring and increased degradation of their aquatic habitats is also continuing um, to happen. So here at Council, um, we are very committed to, to protect the platypus um, and by ensuring that the population that lives in the in the Diamond Creek doesn't just survive but hopefully thrives and about trying to protect the the existing habitat and continue to build habitat and improve our waterways um, and all those tributaries going into the Diamond Creek as well. So it's our intention of the upcoming events that we're running is to improve your awareness, our local awareness about the platypus and also about what things can be done um, to actually help ensure that we can guarantee the future of this, this creature. Um, now, tonight's webinar, as I said, is um, the third in, in um, our fourth in four webinars. One tomorrow night is to do with water bugs. So if you haven't enrolled for that one, certainly um, get on and, and do that. We've also had a couple of other activities, but still happening is that we've got a self-guided bike tour along the Diamond Creek, starting at Edendale Farm. Uh, that you can come along and follow the decals and learn more about the platypus. And then on Sunday, uh, the 30th, so this coming Sunday, we have a platypus celebration um, happening at Edendale Farm in Eltham. Um, and so there'll be a lot of activities, there'll be music, there'll be um, speakers, there'll be all sorts of craft activities and good fun, family fun activities to help us learn more about the platypus. Now at this stage, we are still going ahead with um, COVID restrictions that have been placed on today, but at this stage, we're still going ahead. Um, so um, yeah, just keep an eye out for that as things progress, but certainly at, at this stage um, from 11 p.m., 11 a.m. I should say on Sunday the 30th, um, we'll be having the celebration at um, Edendale. 
So come along and join us. Now, just by uh, way of introduction, so tonight we're going to be focusing on um, native fish species, especially some of those that might be um, um, located within the Diamond Creek. And to take us through this is um, Diane Sharley, who's a freshwater scientist at the Arthur Riley Institute of Environmental, Environmental Research, or ARI it's known as, um, which is in Heidelberg, not too far from the Diamond Creek. And she has over 16 years experience in fisheries research, um, and her area of expertise is fish habitat restoration in freshwater ecosystems. Systems. So um, enough of hearing from me. Um, now I'm going to actually hand over to Joanna, who's going to run the session for tonight. And as I mentioned, um, make sure you put your questions down into the chat and Teresa will be able to ask those um, of Joanna as we go through. So thank you very much, Joanna. Okay, can everyone um, can everyone see the, the PowerPoint there? Yep, that's working well. Yep, great. All right, thanks Richard for that um, introduction and thanks everyone for joining um, and joining um, the audience tonight. Um, as Richard said, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, Victorian native fish species with a snapshot of Diamond Creek. Uh, just bear with me, I'm just trying to turn the page. Just bear with me just for one minute. Just got a bit of technical issues here. I'll be with you in just a second. Okay, down, down button. Yeah, yeah. A bit of issues there. Okay, sorry for about that. Um, that um, for that. Uh, so my background. Um, so I uh, did my applied biology and biotechnology degree at RMIT um, uh, back in two thousand, the year two thousand. Um, since uh, 2008, I've been an aquatic scientist at the Arthur Royal Institute. Some of my projects I've been working on in that time, I've now managed several threatened species uh, monitoring programs, particularly in the Golden Broken catchment. Also um, been involved with several in-stream habitat restoration projects and also environmental flows monitoring programs as well. So who is um, Arthur Royal Institute? So the Arthur Royal Institute for Environmental Research where it's named after Sir Arthur Ryler, who was a minister, who was a politician in the, the Balti government. Um, the Arthur Ryler Institute is located in Heidelberg. Uh, we've been around for, we just celebrated our 50 year anniversary last year. Uh, and we're the leading center for applied aquatic, um, applied ecological research. So we're part of the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning or DELP. And we provide research and management advice um, on a range of flora, fauna and biodiversity issues. And aqu aquatic ecology is a major area of expertise at, uh, at ARI, um, especially fish. Um, water and water management in Victoria, there's, um, there's 10 catchments, catchment management regions in Victoria, which are responsible for management of land, water and biodiversity. Uh, Melbourne Water is responsible for uh, water management in the Port Phillip and Western Port uh, region, and that's going to be the focus of um, tonight's talk. So in the, the Yarra catchment, about a third of Victoria's population is resides in the Yarra catchment. Uh, the Yarra River uh, flows into um, Port Phillip Bay. Its um, the source is um, up in the forested uh, region of the Yarra Ranges National Park above Warburton. And the, air, the catchment includes uh, forests, rural, urban and industry. And, um, and Victorian, Victorian Heritage River, it's known as the Victorian Heritage River between Warburton and Warrandyte. And of course, it has a lot of recreation, nature, conservation, scenic and cultural attributes within the catchment. It can be divided into three subcatchments. Uh, the first one being the Upper Yarra, upper Yarra system. Second being the middle Yarra system, and that's where the Diamond Creek resides. And there's also the lower Yarra River system. So just a bit of a snapshot about the Diamond Creek. It's a, a main tributary of the, of the Yarra River. It's got a catchment size of 311 square kilometres. Its source is all the way up in the King, King Lake Plateau, and it flows through several um, major towns, including St Andrews, Hurstbridge, Diamond Creek and our Neltham where it joins the Yarra River down there. It resides in the Nillimbik Shire 
and some of the main areas of um, main areas within that catchment is grazing and horticulture. Uh, there's two main creeks that, um, that that flow into the Diamond Creek, and they include Running Creek um, and Arthur's Creek, and there's several other ones, smaller ones that also are tributaries of, of Diamond Creek. So Diamond Creek is real, as Richard said before, very significant because it's got um, it's got a population of of, um, of platypus, which have been um, recently classified as vulnerable in Victoria. But it's really encouraging to, to hear that in um, several, there's been several sightings of platypus in, and particularly over the last few weeks. So that's really exciting. Uh, I just wanted to share with you, this is a video um, of a releasing a platypus, which we, we captured not in Diamond Creek, but um, further, further north up in um, the King Parrot Creek, which is a tributary of the, the Goulburn, where we often find um, a lot of platypus. And I just thought uh, this is from our trip um, back in March, and I just thought I'd sort of share share a bit of a video. So we've just caught him in a in a net, and um, he's now happily getting back into his home. Um, Diamond Creek also has a lot of other significant ecological values. Um, it's got a range of native, um, a range of native fish species that reside in Diamond Creek. Uh, and so I'll just give a bit of a snapshot of some of these um, really important um, native fish species which, which are in Diamond Creek. Uh, the first one I'd like to introduce is the river blackfish, um, often also known as slimies or greasies. They can grow up to 60 centimetres in length but generally we find them about 30 centimetres um, in length. They can have a bit of a range of um, body colour, coloration from green to brown to black. And often you'll find a lot of them do have a bit of a mottling pattern on their body, similar to a Murray cod. Now, some of the habitats that we generally find uh, river blackfish include um, within woody, woody habitats, woody debris, logs and things in, in the water, as well as uh, rock as well. And they like to they like to be we uh, mainly find them in uh, slower flowing waters in pools of uh, rivers and creeks. Unfortunately, we're seeing a, a decreasing trend in, in their population. And just some of the photos here. Um, this one here was um, captured from Shepherd's Creek, which is a tributary of the Yarra. And this other one here is a, um, a blackfish we caught in the Wurriyalik Creek, which is again another tributary of the Yarra a couple of years ago. Another very important uh, fish species which is found in Diamond Creek is the Macquarie perch. They're unfortunately a nationally endangered uh, species. They can grow up to 46 centimetres long, but generally we find them around about 30 to 35 centimetres. They're, they're some of the key characteristics of this particular fish. Um, they're generally black or grey in colour. Just, um, just down there, that's a, an adult, adult fish here. So uh, black to grey in colour. Uh, adults have this, this pronounced lateral line down the, down the middle of their body. They've also got this classic um, wide eye as well in, in adults. Now we know that there are long-lived species. We know that um, these, these fish can grow to, to these fish can uh, live up to uh, 27 years old. And similar to black, uh, river blackfish, they reside in uh, woody or rocky habitats in those slower, slower flowing waters. So this map, uh, this map over here gives a bit of a snapshot. Um, in pink is where Macquarie perch historically used to used to live. Now, um, current day, there's about 11, there is 11 populations in in Victoria. Um, in the Yarra down here, you can see there's a population, and this is um, a translocated population, so it's not naturally found in the Yarra River. But back in um, 1857, um, this this fish was translocated. From taken from the Goulburn catchment and um, translocated into into the Yarra River, and this even though this this population is not a natural population, it's a really important population for conservation because recent genetic studies have found that um, it contains genetic diversity no longer found in its um, source populations. So really, really important for for conservation purposes. 
Another little, um, another little fish I like to introduce that's um, that type calls Diamond Creek Home is a common galaxids or a jolly tail. It can grow up to 19 centimetres in length. Um, usually, only um, usually find them around about the 10 centimetre mark. It's green to brown in colour. Um, some fish also have a bit of a mottling pattern on their body, as you can see in the top right hand um, photo. Um, and, and as the name suggest, suggests, it's a very widespread um, fish found throughout the catchment. Um, it is a migratory species, which means um, it, um, it needs to migrate between freshwater and, and estuarine conditions. Um, and this is called, um, so it's a di diadromous fish species. So the adults move down to the estuaries, the eggs are laid on vegetation down there. Larvae spend around six months um, out at sea before returning up, up um, waterways, returning to freshwater environments. And you can see um, just in some of these photos here, um, just how many fish you can, can um, catch. They're very, um, very schooling species. So when we catch them, often you find them in um, high, high abundances. Some other fish species um, found in the Diamond Creek, some native fish species we got up here, we got our spotted galaxid. Um, that's a, quite a rare fish to find. We also um, often find short finned eel, another migratory species which migrates between freshwater and um, estuarine and marine environments. We've got our Australian smelt, which is another common uh, small bodied native fish species. We've also got the southern pygmy perch, which again, similar to some of the other um, fish mentioned before, it is um, a threatened, uh, very threatened, and particularly in the, the northern, northern Victoria, Murray Darling catchment. Another uh, small bodied native fish within Diamond Creek is the flat headed gudgeon as well. And some of the other decapod um, crustaceans and mollusks, which are also being found in the Diamond Creek include the burrowing cray, the southern Victorian spiny cray. We also find the freshwater shrimp and also the river mussel. So in saying that, um, we're in a position where a lot of our native fish species have suffered um, significant declines. So what, what actually happened to our native fish? Well, European settlement was a, a big catalyst for um, declines in native fish populations. And it's estimated in some regions we've lost about 90% of our native uh, fish populations. So I'll just um, touch on some of the key reasons why, some of the, some of the key threats to our native fish populations. The first one, which is a very important threat is um, dams and weirs. Um, so the construction of dams and weirs over time, uh, firstly, it's become a major barrier for fish migration fish um, need to, to move for part of their life cycle. So a barrier um, obviously is a, a major um, obstacle for, for fish to navigate through. Um, it, in fact, and fish need to move for breeding purposes. They need to um, also disperse for different um, life stages of, of species. Uh, fish also need to access for food and also access for refuge areas as well. So dams and weirs have also altered, altered our flows. It's reduced the frequency, magnitude and duration of our winter and spring floods. So we're often finding non-natural flows through several of our um, regulated river systems. And flows um, are important for, for fish for spawning. So flows um, trigger uh, fish moving for, for spawning. Um, we're also finding flows as well, implications for, for cold water pollution in some of our some of, our, um, some of our waterways. Another big um, impact um, which has resulted in reduced fish populations is um, what's called desnagging. So removing these, these big old um, trees from our waterways over time. Um, it's had massive implications for, for native fish species. And trees, they, these, um, these woody structures were removed they thought for um, improving river navigation and also for reducing, um, reducing floods, but that had the complete opposite effect. Some of the other um, um, habitat de degradation issues is loss of riparian vegetation. As you can see, spot and photo here, there's just no, there's no 
there's no vegetation, there's no trees, plants anywhere along, along this, um, in this photo here. So that has implications for inputs of sediment as well. And of course, we've got um, impacts of um, um, stock as well, which in, in has implications for sediment and, and water quality as well. So a few years ago, um, some colleagues of mine at the Arthur Institute um, worked on a project to get an idea of just what condition our, um, our waterways were within, in respect to in stream woody habitats. And so we assessed over 28,000 kilometres of river streams. And the key, key results from this, this project found an average of 41% of our waterways across Victoria were below natural, natural levels. And you can see in this, this, this map here, you've got areas of red had an increase, uh, had a over 80% decrease in, in um, woody, woody habitat within, within the waterways. So you can just see how, um, how, how degraded a lot of these waterways have become over time. So why is habitat important? Well, habitat is for fish and other um, other um, other animals within within our waterways. Um, they're important for, for as a food source, um, also for shelter, and also for breeding areas as well. So your yeah, in-stream habitat is important for these little critters, macroinvertebrates for breeding. If you don't have those those critters, a lot of our a lot of our fish um, and platypus as well just don't have a food source. So really, really important. Um, also, um, habitat is really important for, for breeding of fish. So fish breed um, with on on or under logs or within logs uh, as well as, well as um, as rocks. If you don't have that habitat, you don't have uh, fish breeding. So really, really important to have good um, good in stream habitat. Some other threats to our native fish populations include exotic fish species. So exotic fish species um, can predate on our native fish. They also compete for habitat and food. They decrease water quality, and this can lead to population declines and fragmentation of our native fish. So as well as carp, as shown in the previous slide, some other exotic fish which we, we find in Diamond Creek include the goldfish, um, redfin, and redfin are a really big threat to native fish populations. They're highly predatory, um, so they, they predate on our native fish as well as um, compete for habitat and also food resources. Some other exotic fish found in Diamond Creek include tench, uh, roach, mosquito fish. They're a no, don't let the size fool you. Um, these these small small fish are highly aggressive um, and have um, and very well known for fin nipping of our of, of other fish. And um, very um, even though they're very small, we find them in tend to find them in quite high abundance as well. Prolific breeding. And the final um, exotic fish which is found in Diamond Creek is the Oriental weather leech, another introduced species. So some of the other threats I just wanted to highlight, um, um, disease is, an, is another threat. Um, overfishing and illegal fishing is another big one, which, which has had implications on native fish. Sedimentation is a huge one. So that could be either sand or, or fine sediment. Um, and this sediment fills in critical refuge pools um, and also smothers um, the spawning habitat of um, for native fish and it also smothers the, the eggs as well, which have been laid in, in, in the water or on habitats. Catastrophic events is another big one, which we've particularly seen over the last decade or more. So in the way of drought, major floods and bushfires and runoff, which can have massive implications for our for native fish and the whole ecosystem as a whole. Pollution. Um, pollution is a, one of the biggest um, threats, particularly in, in urban waterways, um, such as uh, Diamond Creek. So this includes stormwater pollution. So we get, um, we get hydrocarbons, inputs of hydrocarbons or oils in the water, um, heavy metals as well, as well as pesticides. And also in urban areas, you, 
you tend to find a lot of um, increase of, um, of litter that ends up in our, through our storm, gets um, put through storm water and enters our waterways. And this can have direct and in indirect implications. So that now that I've given a bit of an overview on threats, um, what's happening to risk to mitigate some of these threats? Um, just like to highlight um, restoring fish passage is a big one um, in the Yarra, the Yarra River catchment. Um, um, studies have found over 150 barriers to fish movement um, within the Yarra River catchment in the, in the form of small weirs and culverts. And this can exclude um, migration of fish, particularly moving upstream. And this is really important because over 70% of native fish species in coastal drainages are diadromous, so which means um, species that move have to move between uh, freshwater and estuarine or marine environments to complete their life cycle. And just a photo in the bottom here, you might be able to see this brown mass here, and that's a um, high, high abundance of common galaxids, um, which are which are congregated below a, a barrier within the water there, that um, is unable to, to navigate through. So improving fish passage at Dites Falls. Um, at Dites Falls, um, there's a three metre high rock weir which was um, constructed back in 1895. Um, to power a flour mill. And this has been identified as a significant barrier to fish movement in the Yarra River. In 1993, a rock ramp fishway was constructed to um, improve or to provide um, um, opportunities for migration of our di of diadromous species. Um, even though that construction did um, improve um, migration of um, these species, um, there still needed to be improvements um, done. It, there, there was implications with um, certain fish couldn't move at certain uh, flows and certain times, and also some species were were um, were weren't uh, able to to pass through from it, from studies. So in two thousand and twelve, the Melbourne Water um, commissioned a new rock ramp fishway and vertical slot fishway to the aims of improving uh, fish passage at Dites Falls. And, um, and I've just put a link, as you can see in the blue there, for anyone would like to, to know more about Dites Falls, um, we there. Um, so monitoring is really important um, for, very important to not only to um, demonstrate that, um, that, the, that these fishways are working and it also provide feedback on existing and future designs there. Um, some of the ways to monitor um, fish movements through to, to make sure that fish are utilising these, these structures. Um, we can put a specially designed um, trap within this, um, this vertical slot fishway as well as physically surveying um, the, the rock ramp fishway as seen in this, this photo there. Another way you can uh, monitor is to um, conduct surveys of um, these tributaries um, and also the main stem of the, the Yarra um, to see what, what if, if you haven't getting improvements with um, fish migration of, um, of our native species. And um, so this is a, a diagram of, um, we've got um, down here, here we've got Dites Falls here. And a survey was undertaken to um, look at the upstream tributaries. Uh, so in this survey, 24 sites were, were surveyed in this, this study. This included um, 20 sites which were upstream of the Dites Falls and four sites which were um, either below Dites Falls or in the Maribyrnong River, which hasn't been impacted by any, any, um, any weirs. And importantly, there was uh, four sites which were chosen in the, in the Diamond Creek to survey. And these included Coddled's Bridge, Strathuan Road site, the Watkins Road, Allendale Road, and Antoinette Avenue. So how did we um, undertake the surveys? We, we, we undertook surveys using backpack electrofishing techniques. 
Um, and so this is a, a really good um, technique to survey small, small tributaries. And it, it, it use a lot, utilizes, it puts a small amount of electricity in the water to temporarily mobilize fish just long enough to be able to catch the fish and, and measure them and identify them. And we use a standard, this standardized survey technique, technique to um, look at the catch per unit effort. So how many fish are we catching um, over, over, the hour, over one hour? So we identified all species when we were doing the surveys. We measured them and weighed them. And we used common galaxids um, as our focal species. And surveys were conducted over a five-year um, period in, um, beginning in 2012 when the Dites Falls um, Fishway was constructed. So just a bit, um, an overview of the results. So this study found a significant increase in the catch per unit effort of um, common galaxids. We also found a significant decrease in the size of common galaxids at those impact sites. So those sites, which are those 20 sites that were above Dites Falls. And this decrease was um, predominantly um, by the, the young of year fish, so we're catching a lot of a lot of the juvenile juvenile fish. So the take home message from this survey was the installation of the fishways did in fact improve fish passage at Dites Falls when we're finding more fish moving through, directly moving through the the the, the fishway and moving up up the main stem of the Yarra and into some of those um, important tributaries of the Yarra River. So another graph to show you, um, what I've just talked about with the increase in um, in the in the abundance of, of common galaxids and the red um, red square here shows the results for Diamond Creek. You can see in 2012 very few common galaxids were, were caught um, at all of the four sites. Um, however, over over the time, um, 2017 where it was surveyed, we see a significant increase in in, um, in common galaxid abundance. Um, similar results for other tributaries um, which were surveyed, including the Mary Creek, um, also in the Yarra River you know, at Warrandyte. Stringer Bark Creek also had um, very significant increases as well. So to uh, Muller Mullen Creek. And the control that included results of those four sites that were below weren't impacted by the Dites Falls. So they remain stable over that time too. So really good, really good result here. And this is a graph showing the, um, the size, size classes of common galaxids caught um, over the study. So impacted sites, they're the, the total of the, the 20 sites above Dites Falls here. In the black bars is the, the sizes of the fish caught in 2012 and the white bars are 2017. So you can see in 2012, um, we caught 103 fish, 2017, over 700. But more importantly here, we're getting um, more of those smaller size class fish, those little, um, little juveniles, young of year fish that have, that have been out at sea um, and then travelled up, up the, the main stem of the Yarra. They've navigated their way through Dites Falls and all the way up into those um, into their tributaries. Whereas compared to the four sites which weren't impacted by by the by the fall uh, by Dites Falls here, you can see getting um, universal um, size classes here. When we look at um, Diamond Creek alone here, back in 2012, only nine of those common galaxies were caught, compared to 2017, where nearly 160 um, fish were caught, which is a really, really good result. So I'll just finish here by um, by a bit of a bit of a overview of, of what what is industry doing to improve waterway health. I've touched on um, why why it's important to restore fish passage, and uh, water water managers are doing a great job at restoring fish passage, given how that's a big threat to our native fish populations. Improving in stream habitat is another big one, which is um, which is taking place more and more now given how we know that um, reduced in stream habitat is having, that's had detrimental impacts to our native fish. Maintaining, maintaining adequate flows is another, another big one which has been, been conducted. 
particularly in regulated systems. However, in, in un, unregulated waterways, um, regulation of water extractions, particularly during times of low flows, is a really important one to maintain um, the flows during those, in, those, in those waterways. Exotic species management, so that also includes uh, removal of pest fish, as well as uh, weeds and, and um, non-native plants. And riparian restoration is another big one, which, which, is, which, is, which has been happening a lot too, um, as well as uh, fence, fencing off um, to um, protect our riparian vegetation along our streams. So what can you do? So everyone has a role to play, whether it be big or small. Um, you can get involved with many, many local community groups. Um, one I've mentioned there is land care. So um, you can all have take a part in um, going along to tree planting days, which are excellent events. You can also get involved with um, monitoring water quality. Um, and there's plenty of programs um, that you can get involved with through the Water Watch program. Um, I know firsthand how important monitoring water quality, particularly in small, small waterways are. Um, with the work I do mainly in the, the Gombroken catchment, um, during those low flow periods where um, the creeks either stop flowing or really low flows, having, having um, community on ground giving us information about at, at, um, what, the, what the water quality is like in these these systems is, is really, really important. So um, yeah, I can't stress how highly, highly rated um, getting involved with Water Watch and monitoring uh, water quality in your, in your area. Um, another one I'd like to flag is um, reducing stormwater pollution. And this is an example of an education and awareness program run by Nillambic Shire, which highlights the impacts of stormwater pollution in, um, in, in Diamond Creek. It's a really big issue. So everyone can play a role in reducing stormwater pollution. Some of the things you can do, to, everyone can do to reduce stormwater pollution, um, dispose of rubbish properly and, um, and picking up litter. It's really important. Uh, reducing pesticide uses. Um, not to dump chemicals into stormwater or waterways. Another big one is um, picking up after your dog so that doesn't end up in our waterways and pollutes our, our waterways. Um, clean up spills immediately. And finally, reducing our reliance on cars. And, um, and that's, that's really important because the, the, the tyres, um, as we drive them, they, little bits of the, that rubber um, um, comes off and eventually during a, a rain event that gets washed into our waterways and they're full of hydrocarbons and heavy metals. So that's, that's, a, really big, um, that's a really big input to uh, of pollution in, in through the stormwater systems, particularly in our urban environments um, such as Diamond Creek. Uh, so that brings us to the end of um, tonight's presentation. Um, just like to thank uh, Melbourne Water for um, the opportunity to, to, to come along and talk to, to tonight, as well as Nillambic Shire as well. Thank you very much. I'd like to um, thank my colleagues from the Arthur Roll Institute, uh, particularly for providing um, a range of images um, shown in tonight's presentation. And especially want to Frank, uh, thank Frank M Amstatter from ARI, who managed the program um, assessing the, the fish populations through the, the tributaries um, after the Dites Falls fishways. Uh, so thank you, Frank. Um, and thank you to all everyone tonight for, for tuning in. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. That was that was really interesting. Um, thank you so much. Absolutely great talk. Uh, we've got one question that's come in already. Does the platypus eat native fish? I can answer that one. Flat Platypus don't tend to eat fish, so they will eat the water bugs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's their main diet. Um, got another question here. With increased sea to flow events in the upper Diamond Creek, is it likely river blackfish will persist? Again, that's a yeah, river blackfish. Um, when, when you get low flow events, that has issues for, for water quality. So yes, it, it can 
impact by fish populations, yeah. Um, so reduced flows also um, mentioned, uh, mentioned refuge, refuge pools, and they're really important. So what happens when low flows, um, fish need to access the, the deeper pools in, in the waterways. So as long as um, you can maintain connectivity to those, those deeper pools, those refuge pools, um, that's really important um, for, for blackfish and, and Macquarie perch and other, other native fish as well in Diamond Creek. Uh, another question, is the Diamond Creek a naturally dirty creek or should the water be clearer? Uh, I'd like to say, yeah, so historically it would have been a lot, lot clearer. Um, just the nature of its um, the land use, um, it, it would have been a lot. It's, it's, it's definitely a lot, lot more turbid than what it historically would have been. I would, I would like to say. Thank you. Another question. Um, so Georgina is just saying thanks for the information, and a question: What impact do you think brown trout are having on native fish? Yes, brown trout are a big threat to our native fish, particularly those small-bodied small bodied native fish, yes. Um, and then, oh, we've got loads of questions coming in now, which is great. So is there a monitoring system in respect to illegal damming? That would probably come from Melbourne Water. Um, I can't actually answer that question. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, happy to get back to people about that. Yes, um, not sure. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, so does water temperature impact fish breeding? How will a warming climate impact on our native fish? Yes, yeah, so water temperature has a big, um, a big impact on, on breeding. Um, we know it's very species specific, but we, we know um, a, a lot about our native fish and, and what temperatures they need to, to for, for breeding, yeah. Um, if you could do change one thing to the Diamond Creek, what would you do to improve it for native fish? Probably the stormwater inputs are a, a big, they're a big, they're, they're often, it's, it's, it's a bit of what you can see, but also what you can't see. So you might be able to see hydrocarbons or oils on the surface or litter. They're things that you can see um, as pollution, but it's also, also the heavy metals as well. So the heavy metals, you can't necessarily, you can't, that they get um, binded up in the, in the sediment. And that sediment's really important for macroinvertebrates to breed. If you don't have the macroinvertebrates to breed, um, you don't have the food sources for fish um, and also platypus as well. And other, another, another animals that that are in the in the waterway. Yep, thank you. And I just wanted to add to that with the, about that that pollution as well. And you, you're mentioning about litter. So, um, for those of you that weren't tuned in on Thursday's talk by Jeff Williams from the Platypus Conservancy, uh, platypus have the so Diamond Creek has the second highest rate of platypus entanglement in litter. Mm -hmm. And I asked. Um, Jeff, what made that happen? And he said that Diamond Creek has a large amount of litter going in the system, much more than other places. Um, so yes, that, that is particularly an issue in Diamond Creek. Uh, Georgina's asking, uh, will this video and web platypus webinar be available online somewhere? Yes, it will be. So we'll be putting it on the Nilimbic Richard, will it be on the Nilimbic or Edenvale yeah. website? Yeah, we're certainly going to just finalise that. It'll be definitely available either at the Nilimbic or the Edenvale site, if not both. So, yep. So we'll we'll make that available, and and we'll be able to notify you when that happens as well. So, um, in respect of the platypus, does DELP or fisheries translocate them from another system if an area is vulnerable? Um, my understanding, Joe, have you got any information on that? I don't believe that that takes place, but um, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'd, I'd say no. Yeah, I was I was going to say, I think the thing with the platypus as well is um, the platypus are very territorial, so they have a home range. Um, and so if platypus are missing from a system, um, that's often to do with the fact that they're 
um, you know, they, there's impact, there's a loss of habitat. So it would make it um, difficult if that, that home range is already taken up, then it would make it difficult to translocate them. Plus they're pretty difficult to catch as well. Mm. Um, are there any cleanup programs to prevent further entanglements of platypus? Uh, well, there was actually a cleanup on Sunday at Diamond Creek and this series of events as this platypus celebration, this is actually come out of wanting to raise awareness of platypus in Diamond Creek. So if you um, just keep a look around your local friends of group, uh, there's another group called Love Our Streets. They do litter cleanups. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, so you can contact me via waterwatch at melbourneWater.com.au as well, and I can give you some contacts as well. Um, so can you test sediments for heavy metals? Uh, again, are you happy for me to answer that one, Joe? That's fine, yep. Yeah, so you can test sediments for heavy metals. And what you can actually do is um, when you test the sediment, so the top layer of the sediment, if you go down a certain depth, you can see what's been happening historically. So maybe over the last you know, period of months or, or years, but there's also another way that you can um, test for heavy metals as well. And it's called, um, passive sampling. So I worked on a project with the Werribee River Association and Bio2 Lab. And what the passive samplers do is they go in the stormwater drains and then they catch those particles that are coming out from the stormwater drains and then you can test those for heavy metals. And what we actually found is we, by using that method and using the sediment sampling, we were actually able to highlight where in the Werribee River uh, was the most contaminated area. Um, so it's would be able to do something like that for Diamond Creek and, and Bio2Lab do actually do work like that all over Melbourne. Um, are there litter traps on Diamond Creek? I don't know the answer to that, Richard. Are you able to answer that? I don't know the answer to that either as a general comment. I know that um, at Edendale, it's, it's sometimes these, these stormwater drains are very well hidden. Uh, we don't know how many there are actually feeding into the Diamond Creek, but I know that um, there is one at the entrance of Edendale and there's one at the, at the, at the rear end of um, Edendale as well. So there's two there and I haven't seen any um, litter traps on those ones in particular. Um, so it's, it's a really is a, in some ways a bit of a hidden um, issue because we don't often see the, um, the, the um, stormwater drains um, and that's basically pick up all that stormwater off the streets and houses from you know, further up into Eltham as an example. So um, yeah, it can have a huge impact, but I haven't seen any um, traps on those particular um, stormwater drains. And, and what we're really trying to do now is so Melbourne Water recently, uh, we did a litter action project. So that was in partnership with Nilimbic and we installed a solar compacting bin. Um, so it's very much now the focus, we're trying to focus on reducing litter from getting into the waterways in the first place. And as Richard said, you know, like if you can see the litter, that's the stuff that's not really the problem. It's the stuff that you can't see that's that's hidden. When we see it, we can pick it, we can clear it away, but there's just, you know, the stuff we can't see obviously isn't able to be removed from the river. Um, are ARI doing more fish surveys next year, 2022, in the 24 locations in the ARA catchment? Uh, I'd have to get back to you on that. I'm not 100% not sure. Yep, cool. Thank you. Um, comment just saying wonderful. Uh, Mark saying I'm a local and not as far as I'm aware of. So I think that was in response to the litter traps. Yep, yep, yep that was in response to litter traps. So is is there any way basket traps can be installed on the drain gates at the gutter level, not allowing the debris to get into the water? I work on waterways, a question of interest. Any comments, Joe or Richard? Yeah. No, I haven't at this stage got any comments. Um, so yeah, if, if, Technologically, it might be it might be possible, um, but I'm just not quite sure from actually clearing them and you know potentially becoming barriers for stormwater and things like that as well. So there would have to be some issues sorted out there, I imagine as well. 
Yeah, and and obviously when when you're putting in traps, they they then need to be regularly cleaned as well. Mm. So just having the capacity to be able to remove the rubbish as well can often pose um, some difficulty. Yeah. Um. Has anybody else got any questions? You can post them up. I've got one for you, Joe. So with the fish with the fishways, is there um. Like, do you notice, because obviously those native fish need to move up through the fishways, mm -hmm. is there any evidence that the invasive fish are using them as well? I believe they, yes, they would, yeah. So it, it, it um, yeah, encourages all fish moving, moving through, yeah. Yeah. And so prior to the fishway at Dites Falls, does that mean that the galaxids just wouldn't have been in the system because they wouldn't have been able to get up that far? Yes, it was a, a big barrier for for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Another, another species too, which so the common galaxids were the focus of the the tributary project, just because you'll be able to catch them in in high numbers to be able to do your statistics on them. Whereas you've got other species which we're finding uh, moving through, um, such as such as Chupong and um, another endangered species, Australian grayling, and so we've and results from from um, from the trapping within the fishways itself, um, finding those some of those species which haven't been caught for a very long time um, above Dites Falls. So it's yeah, it's a, it's a really it's a really good story. Great, thank you. Um, just another question: um, Has there been many examples of reintroducing wood into urban waterways for fish habitats? Yeah, so there's a range of projects um, that, have, that have been been done. I've, I, um, one personally that I was involved with, with Melbourne Water, uh, I think it's 2014, we were reintroducing habitats in, um, in Watts, the Watts River um, over in Healesville. Um, there was um, also Bunyip, um, the Bunyip and Tarago Rivers. And there was also the, the Wurriyalik and um, the Wurriyalik um, Creek um, in in your limbo as well. It was about five or six locations where uh, where woody habitats were in, re reinstated, particularly for a river blackfish. So that's um, and there's there's quite a few other examples that, that Melbourne Water have been particularly working on through through the Yarra and um, and tributaries as well. So more and more projects are, are, are similar have been are, are happening, knowing how important mainstream habitat is for for, for native fish. Yep, cool. Thank you. And so can you, Joe, can you briefly expand on the decline of maca population in the area, particularly relating to the reduction of size of adult fish, possible causes, etc.? Yeah, sure. So there's been a lot of work, particularly ARI, been, we've done a lot of population assessments in, in, the, in the Yarra for a long time. And we've got information from different um, different environmental events, so the drought, the, the, the floods, all sorts of um, conditions. And so what we're finding the, over time in a reduction in, in the, the size of, um, of um, the fish, the adult fish, so very few fish were, were getting caught over, over, over 30 centimetres. And, and all this information um, has, has been put forward to, um, at the moment, Previously, up um, the to angling was um, thought to be a big, a big, um, big reason why we, we weren't getting the the adult fish um, in the in the system, and that um, all that research as well as other research that's been done from um, project partners with Native Fish Australia to be one one other one, um, and it's it's led to the Macquarie perch being protected in, in the Yarra River. So they're, they're protected now, which is, um, which is good. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Uh, are anglers encouraged to remove the other invasive species you listed? Carp is mandated and redfin is encouraged. It isn't, yes. It, um, by rights, red, redfin aren't classified the same as, as carp. But in my opinion, redfin um, uh, a really big um, threat to, to native fish. So. I would highly encourage anyone that, that does catch redfin to remove it from, from the system. Yep. 
Thank you. Um, that appears to be it for questions. So thanks everyone. I'll just hand back over to Richard. Beautiful. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you very much, Joanne. Um, just a couple of points I wanted to emphasise. Um, I also come from a bit of a gardening background, so I'd just like to reiterate the um, being aware of the way our soils and the chemicals that we use um, within our gardens can really impact um, waterways and, and quality of water, uh, whether it be the nitrates from fertilisers, the surfactants from you know, soil wetting agents or the pesticides that we're using. All of these things can, can slowly make their way through our soils into storm water into our creeks and have a, a bit of an invisible impact on the life within our within our. Um, um, our creek systems and water systems. So even the, the home gardener needs to be really aware of the sorts of impacts they're having on water bugs, fish, platypus, all of those sort of things. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a couple of um, big drains near Edendale, stormwater drains, um, and we use those as an educational um, tool to try and educate kids that you don't even need to live next to a, um, um, a, a, a creek, you just have to live next to a drain and then you can impact on the quality um, of the water that's going through that. Um, so I'd just like to thank very much um, Joanna for presenting today all around the, um, the native fish. Um, as I mentioned, this is the third in a series of four. So we have another webinar tomorrow night, which is about water bugs with John Goodrum. Um, so again, that will be introducing some of the, the food sources for the native fish, but also the platypus. Um, so that will be a very interesting um, um, webinar as well. We also have the, um, still in our, in our um, platypus celebration activities. We still have the um, the, uh, the decals on the Diamond Creek path, which will be there for quite a long time now so that you can come along and learn a bit more about the um, about the platypus um, and what you can do to help it. And then on Sunday, as I mentioned earlier, we are still having the um, platypus celebration at Edendale from 11 to four o'clock, uh, where we'll have craft activities, um, um, community groups, talks on different aspects of the platypus. Um, we'll be having, um, you know, all, all sorts of things, um, games and, and lots of education um, experiences for the family around what they can do to help the platypus. So um, definitely very much going to be COVID safe um, but, and we'll be keeping an eye out for any changes in COVID restrictions over the next few days. But at this point in time, we are still going ahead with that. So um, I'd just like to very much again, thank Joanna for, um, for um, sharing with us all of that really great information um, about our um, waterways, the Diamond Creek and native fish. Also so Teresa, thank you very much and Melbourne Water for supporting um, this series of, of webinars. Um, and to everyone out there, um, love your Diamond Creek, love all your native fish and love your platypus as well. And hopefully we might get to see you on Sunday. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Teresa, I'll see you um, later. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joanna. Bye-bye. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks, everyone.